What's up Hobby Maniacs, Rob Bear here today with another 40k flashback. I thought it would be appropriate seeing how there's a bunch of Space Marine releases coming out right around this time to go back and take a look at the old 2nd edition Angels of Death Codex. Seeing as how we're getting an Angels of Death supplement coming out, I thought it'd be cool to look back at the old Angels of Death book, which isn't quite the same as what's coming out now, because Space Marines, you know, are basically called the Angels of Death, and that's kind of what they've evolved into. But back in 1993, 1994, there was the Angels of Death Codex, which contained the rules for both the Blood Angels and the Dark Angels together. So that was like a big thing back then because they didn't feel like that they needed their own separate books, even though the Space Wolves got their own separate book back then, along with uh, Codex Ultramarines as well. So it was kind of like a, um, a, a kind of a, a testbed a marketing thing by Games Workshop to see if uh, people actually cared about the Blood Angels and the Dark Angels. It turns out they do. <laughs> and, you know, starting with third edition, they, they got their own books there on going forward. And, you know, I think the Blood Angels got a um, kind of like a PDF. White Dwarf kind of deal for one of the editions and but for the most part they've always had a separate book available to uh, collectors and players throughout the years but it all started right here and we're gonna take a look at it because this is the old uh, this is the old second edition uh, Mamma Jamma you can tell it's uh, it's not in the best uh, condition you know I was a little bit hard on my stuff back in the day you know um, little little Robbie B wasn't uh, wasn't so so good with his stuff but fortunately it has endured and we we still have it here to take this great look at one of the things I liked about the old books. Now, remember, this was the this was the they called it the red period or the spiky period, uh, because most of the stuff in these books were all painted red. All the graphics were red. All the, the supplement cards and and extra things that came in the box sets were all red. It was the red period, and, and they just loved painting shit red for some reason. And don't get me wrong, it looked great for the most part, and you know it was very stylish and it was very indicative of the time. Even the boxes themselves, a lot of times, were red. But you know it it kind of got old pretty quick, you know, and they kind of went to the unified kind of uh, blister and box set format shortly thereafter. But the other thing that I liked about this period was all of the amazing Mike McVeigh dioramas and models that you could find in these codexes because he was kind of like their their wizard uh, model maker, kind of scenery guru guy. They had Tony Cottrell making all the scratch belt stuff who went on to eventually to uh, found Forge World and he's still there designing stuff to, the, to this day. And Mike McVeigh, of course, we all know has his own studio and has done a lot of things uh, both with Games Workshop, Privateer Press and his own studio. I think he does some stuff with Simon now. I'm not sure if they've broken up, but I don't know. I can't keep track of it anymore. But anyways, uh, he is an amazing hobbyist. Uh, puts out some amazing looking stuff and you know back then for being limited on all the hobby materials and things he still put out some amazing looking shit I mean he's got you know a, a chapel of the rock with stained glass and all this stuff here I mean it's just scratch bill you know early 90s like I couldn't I couldn't have done that I mean granted I wasn't on the same level I am right now but I mean for what was available back then this is amazing to me and all of this is scratch bill you can see all these dioramas on display at Warhammer World, I believe. So if you're ever out there and you want to check it out, you'll probably see a lot of kind of dated looking stuff, but to be quite honest, it's a classic. And well, classics besides being expensive a lot of times are, are, are kind of dated looking, but that's part of their appeal, I feel like. So here's the contents of the book, right? And you've got the last sections here, kind of like, you know, we see these days are, we're all army lists and things like that, right? But the, the big thing is the kind of the fluff sections and there's a there's a section in here a colored section because yo they wanted to do um, you know they want they want you guys to you know they wanted us to be like oh shit look at this stuff it was painted so well I want I want it but the rest of the basic stuff you know the rules and everything were black and white which we saw up until you know recently with fifth edition sixth edition that's basically how it was forever so there was that and they even called it the color section because you know back then color printing was it was expensive so to get this kind of level like this is a true codex size book like they went in second edition that had the true codex size 100 110 pages and then they went to third edition and slimmed it down a lot of people are like yo where's my fluff i want my fluff but you know gw they became more of they evolved into more of a company instead of a company driven by like hobbyists and things and in that period between second and third edition you could definitely see a lot of changes that set the, 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 the basically the groundwork or the foundation for what we see today as far as you know um, 
uh, kind of cost-cutting initiatives or just things that helped improve the game and make it easier not only for us to play on the tabletop but for them to produce as well. So here you basically gets into the history of the Space Marines, stuff we always see in every codex, you know, breaking down power armor. Then it gets into the history of the Dark Angels, the history of the Blood Angels, and then a lot of um, the actual forces themselves, like the, you know, the actual dudes. This would be the bestiary section uh, that they used to call it in the codexes these days. And then it gets into the army list. And another thing you're going to notice, too, is back in 2nd edition, there wasn't troops, HQs, um, elites, fast attacks. There was characters, squads, and support. And then of course you had special characters. And special characters even up until a little while ago were like a big deal. Like, oh, you're bringing a special character? I don't know. Ooh, I don't know if I can handle it. You know, but nowadays everybody has a special character because they want some ability. And it, it's it's funny how the, the boogeyman, the 40k boogeyman has progressed from special character to Forge World to a knight to Lords of War to like, it just keeps progressing up and up and up. And I, I don't even know where we're going to go from here you know what I mean I guess formations are the new boogeyman or detachments or I, I don't even know anymore because it just seems like every year there's a new hot button issue flyers were in there flyers with the boogeyman for a while so it's just it's just it's super hilarious to see you know thinking back to what was I afraid what didn't I want to or what was more challenging to play against in this edition and that was a special character because they would just basically mop up the table. It was Hero Hammer. There's no doubt about it. Back in 2nd edition, it was Hero Hammer. Games would take forever. It'd basically be an afternoon. The Psychic Face freaking took like an hour each one. It was just ridiculous. It was like a game in a game. It was an, it was a non-mini game inside your 40k game. So th th those are some of the things that you're going to notice here as, as we take a closer look at things that are different to what they are today. So there's some great looking line art in here. You know, you had John Blanche, you had Wayne England, you have Mark Gibbons. And Mark Gibbons is that guy that has that makes all that really striking like kind of portrait dynamic portrait i think he did the black templar that's like holding the the uh the standard and he's kind of popping off a shot but he's like half blown apart you know he did a great portrait of azrael that's in here um some of the the chapter masters of the captains you know for some of the sundered legions like the raven raven guard um there's a great picture of shrike that he did that always stand out to me so really great artist amazing very talented person that really a lot of people might not realize who he was until you start n naming and showing off the art. So here's all the fluff section, you know, talking about the Horus Heresy, talking about the Codex Astartes, the Power Armor, all that stuff. And this right here, this picture actually of the Emperor, or that, well, it goes right here. I think it was actually in this book first, was where we saw for the first time what the Emperor looked like. Like, I don't even think that was in the Rogue Trader book back then. So, oh, here's actually a piece of Mark Gibbons art right there, the um, uh, Azrael and... Uh, the little watcher in the dark right there and so it talks about the rock and it basically all the flavor and everything and builds the stage for what we know about the dark angels and the blood angels today and that's all right in here and then it gets into special units you know talking about the death guard talking about terminators so you know very similar stuff to what we have today then it gets into what they call the color section and you know i'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because it's it's not stuff that's, that to us is like oh hey check that out you know it's kind of these models were kind of terrible back in the day I mean, they look bad now. They weren't terrible back in the day. They were metal with plastic shoulder pads and a plastic backpack that came uh, on a separate little sprue that was about this big that would come in a blister with these guys because it was cheaper for them to do those components in plastic than it was in pewter. So, you know, you see these guys and they're like so static. You're like, oh my God, that's junk. But, yo, that's all we had back then. And it was amazing to us. You know, I'm just like, and I look back at it. I'm like, man, that's classic. But, man, I am certainly glad I don't have to play, <laughs> play uh, you know, play with those anymore. And then here's some, just some stuff about, you know, the formation and the heraldry of the Dark Angels. Remember, this was, this is the first time we saw any of this stuff in it. And it really got people like, identifying with certain chapters, you know, as, as, as a person, you know, they say you could probably, you identify with a chapter based on your, your personality traits. And I, I definitely think there's some truth in that. So here's a, a closer look at some of the a wider array of figures that were available at the time that had a sergeant or a captain and all of the heavy weapons you're probably noticing hey those look a lot like you know the stuff Forge World's coming out with for Horus Heresy and that's loosely what it was based off of to be quite honest and now we're seeing the, the underslug kind of type um, because I think Forge World wants to get away from the whole Mark 1 kind of look or they just want to sell new stuff which could be a little a bolt I feel like and then here's more Raven Guard and you can see some of these characters are definitely dated the, they're the same characters from nearly, I mean, when you figure 2014, you're, you're talking 
20 years right there and we're already a few years past that so some of the stuff is is older the miniature design is literally older than the gamers that play it and you know for good or bad it's hard to say i think they've i think they the designs themselves for the most part a lot of the pewter special characters have held up over time the problem is when you put it next to a current plastic marine he looks like he's a midget almost and you know he is not sized appropriately and you're just like man that guy's supposed to be so badass but why does he look so much smaller than my 2000 you know 12 tactical marine you know a plastic box and you're like hmm that's a good question <laughs> i would love to see some remakes of some of these guys here in the future and i'm sure eventually we will there's the mark one the old mark one razorback style or rhino style and then they had the pewter components that went on top and this was the very first you know they had the twin linked plasma and single last cannon now a lot of people might might not realize that was what came with it. For a, for a while, we didn't get the Twin Link Glass Cannon or the Twin Link. We didn't even get the option to take an Assault Cannon until the mid-2000s. So this was all that was available to us as hobbyists. And it was cool to see that they, they brought that back as an option, but not exactly available in kit form, you know, plastic-wise there. Venerable Dark Angel Dreadnought. Now, this was the... Uh, I forget what they called it, but the one with the, the, two, the two weapons, the... Uh, Daka Dread kind of format. There's a sp specific name to it that it was only available to the Dark Angels for a while, and um, you know eventually they unlocked that to everybody. So here's all the fluff on the Blood Angels, the Heraldry, and things, and it gets into obviously we know Mephiston, Corbulu, and Dante are the same design as they was they were before, but again they stand. They, I feel like they stood the test of time. However, when you put them up against a uh, Blood Angel Tactical Marine from 2014, they're not going to stand the test of time, you know what I mean? So it's kind of uh, bittersweet, I guess, in, in that regard there. And then here's a look at the uh, the old crazy, uh, I call it the crayon pattern whirlwind from back in the day. That was, all of this was pewter components. It actually balanced on the model quite well. And there was this pewter components in the front here. Man, whirlwinds were actually really interesting because they were guess range and you could use uh, kind of basic Pythagorean theorem in your head to try to triangulate where to shoot and you know a blast template was big back then a vindicator you didn't want to get hit by a vindicator you didn't want to get hit by a whirlwind it was really neat to see and it was uh, it was fun and then here's the um, the furioso pattern it actually started out as just the name of a dreadnought it wasn't a, a pattern per se you know with the two close combat weapons but eventually in third edition it got turned into that and then here's some of the uh, war gear cards you could actually take it was hero hammer back then so you could equip your guys with like certain things and you know you can buy a vortex grenade for your guy or you can buy a las gun or you can buy a chain axe for all of your leaders and things like that and that's what made it so cool because they, they went from rogue trader which was like an RPG kind of um, tabletop skirmish kind of thing, right? To what we have now in, you know, the second edition book here, which is basically like trying to take it more from uh, less of an RPG, but an RPG perspective from your general to more of a bigger. Um, not skirmish, but kind of like a mid-level kind of game that would take an afternoon. And the third edition was full-on, full battle armies, you know, and then it kind of went on, so on and so forth from there. You know, and we're seeing a lot of that today with, uh, it's it's kind of like the life cycle of a game. You know, we're seeing it with Privateer Press. You know, they're just announced Privateer Press uh, version 3, you know, for War Machine or Hordes. And, the, you know, it's be basically because they go from a small skirmish game, they add more components, they add more components, it gets bigger. And then they have to start, you know, either condensing down codes, you know, blister packs into bigger sets because retailers can't carry all this stuff, which is what happened with all the blister packs from Games Workshop back in the day, to a bigger game in a bigger form that supports all of these new units and it's kind of the natural life cycle of the game and this is this is more towards you know kind of like the mid cycle with games workshop here you know they were they were transitioning into that kind of a bigger role on the tabletop when everybody else was either playing RPGs or Magic the Gathering was just really taking hold. It was uh, literally the first year for Magic about the time this came out. So game stores as a whole were kind of starting to pop up everywhere and become kind of like the thing that they've been for a lot of folks, you know, like the nerd bar, so to speak, for the last, you know, say uh, 20, 25 years here, at least in the States, I feel like. What I liked about this was, this was the first uh, story right here about the duel between Lehman Russ and Lionel Johnson, you know, the first time we saw that in print. And, it, you know, I remember reading this for the first time, I was like, yo, <laughs> those guys are badass. I want to be a Primark, right? <laughs> so, you know, there's plenty of history in here and plenty of cool stuff. And then it gets into the war gear. 
the stuff you can take. But remember, you're going to have all of these. These were actual War Gear cards that came with the starter box. So you're going to have little physical cards, which I kind of wish they did today and had all the little cards and, and things and um, kind of like game aids, kind of like Privateer Press does with their unit cards. Oh my God, I would kill to have freaking unit cards for my armies, something that was standardized. I would literally buy that Games Workshop. Please put those damn things out because they are so they're so much easier and it's so easy to just between X-Wing and Plan Pri Privateer, I always found it so so easy to just have the quick reference card out instead of looking at a freaking army list or something like that. You know, it just made it easier to keep track of things on the tabletop, I feel like. Maybe I'm just old and I can't. You know, I, my brain's small. I don't know. But I, I'm a visual guy. I like visual aids. So there it is. And then so here's all the army list and it basically shows, you know, all your stat lines and things, how many points. And, you know, they didn't make a big thing out of it. They didn't put like one thing here with the big picture and the points cost you know up here they basically you know just put as much content into these books as they could because it was like a hundred some pages and they didn't have all the fluff designed so they couldn't talk for like half the book about fluff like they do now but you know so they had to condense and they had to rearrange stuff which is totally totally understandable and totally reasonable and they didn't get to the blood angels army list section and there was a lot of cool stuff like you could actually take allies back then you could have tarantula weapon platforms rapier laser destroyers these were brought over from necromunda those were actual models that you could buy for necromunda and then people were like yo let me play them in 40k and they're like sure why not here's some rules for them right and then it gets into just your normal stuff. Here's another great piece of Mark Gibbons art, um, Fist on the Lord of Death right there. Mark Gibbons is an amazing artist. I, I, I was very sad when he left Games Workshop. I think he went to Blizzard for a while. Um, there's a new project he's worked on that uh, we'll be showing off on here, here in the near future. So stay tuned for that one. And then in the back, they did this little catalog where they basically put in all the components because remember you used to be able to buy bits from Games Workshop so if you want a Mephistos Force Sword well there's the code right there just call up mail order and be like yo I want that that's the code right there and they would also show you like what you would get in each one as well so it was kind of like a, a standardized catalog which they also collected into what they called annuals and there would be like you know a 1993 annual 1994 annual they got away from it in the late 90s but they actually came back to it around 2003 did it for a couple of years and they got away from it and of course they haven't sold bits in like forever so um I'm, I'm sure we won't see that again for a while so but it was neat to see because you could be like oh look at that guy it was like basically like a mini built-in catalog in all of their uh, their stuff here and here you can see a lot of the pewter marines that used to be you know individually purchased and then you get the the plastic arms the plastic arms sprue this was the plastic accessory sprue with your weapons and things and then you would also there was a small shoulder pad sprue that i was talking about i guess it's not quite they didn't show it in here but there was just a small sprue with shoulder pads which everybody would use uh, to form their guys up and there's the old metal land speeder which is definitely the basis for a forge old one as well and all the dreadnoughts the whirlwind razorback and there's all those pewter components that went on the plastic and it actually balanced pretty well and there's the old uh not before they went to a pewter component with the plastic uh the plastic predator mark one right there so whew, man i have not been not time has not been kind on this codex that's for sure but hey can't really complain that much there. So that was the uh, the first uh, the second edition Warhammer 40k Angels of Death. Obviously, not exactly what's coming out here. Uh, the Space Marine supplement for Games Workshop, but still something pretty cool to take a look at and kind of reminisce and walk down memory lane. Deleted scenes, bonus content, and all the interviews and post-game wrap-up videos can be located in the Hall of Veterans on thelongward.net. Visit thelongward.net today and try a week completely free with no strings attached. That's not all. TheLongWord.net is also your hobby resource for exclusive early access with an ad-free experience to all your favorite videos. Members of the Hall of Veterans gain early exclusive access to multiple hobby videos.